Mr. Lovett, tell us who you are and what is your connection with the Spanner case? Well, uh, my name is John Lovett and I'm a solicitor, which in the United States would be called an attorney. And I came to London in, oh, many years ago when I was 33 and uh, discovered leather and little more than that. But then, as a lawyer, I learned about this famous case called the Spanner case. And I was reading all the reviews of it. I thought, well, I'd quite like to find out a bit more about that. And I saw in the gay press that there was a club called SM Gays who was going to give a talk on the Spanner case. So I went along. Now, prior to that, I had no idea what sadomasochism was. Wow. Yeah. So that is how I came to come into the Spanner case in about the early 1990s. The case then had actually happened. Uh, the court case had happened. They'd been convicted. They'd been sentenced. They'd been to the Court of Appeal. They'd appealed. Their appeals had been reduced. But a campaign was then being launched called the Countdown on Spanner campaign to try and get some resources available, some money available, so that they could appeal, so they could appeal to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. So that is how I first came into the Spanner case in the early 1990s, assisting with that campaign to try and raise money for the appeal to Strasbourg. Tell me more about that appeal. How did that transpire? How did it transpire? Um, well, I think it transpired because the whole world was horrified by what had happened. And a lot of the money came not from this country, but from all over the world, and principally, I have to say, from the United States. Mm. And in 2006, the Chicago Hellfire Club decided to have a fundraiser at Inferno for the Spanner case, as it was then called. And as I was then a trustee of the Spanner Trust, I went along and assisted with the fundraising. How did you come to be one of the trustees? Ah, well, as I am both a lawyer and into SM, uh, one of the trustees, who was a client of mine, said, John, you must come and be one of the trustees because you're a lawyer and you know the criminal law and you're into SM so you understand all about it. So I was invited in about 2004, I think it was, to become a trustee. What did that entail? What did that entail? Ah, well, the trust was already established um, and had been established as a trust because the American donors said they're not going to give money to just some group of individuals they don't know anything about. Mm. They wanted to establish just a legal trust. Ah, in fact, I've forgotten about that. That's how I came to be involved because they wanted a trust deed drawn up. And as one of the trustees was a client of mine, he said, John, will you draw up a trust, trust deed for us? And of course, I said, yes, I'm happy to do that. And I, I will do it free of charge. So I, I drew up the trust deed to set up the Spanner Trust in the first place. I remember now. Uh, yeah. I see. I see. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> tell us a little bit more about your life as a lawyer and how you've been able to combine that with your work on this. Ah, well, I started off in London when I came here at the, at the age of 30 as a commercial property lawyer mm -hmm. and worked in a big commercial property firm and was very successful uh, professionally, made a lot of money, but it was incredibly boring. <laughs> and I was paying tax at 55%. And a locum solicitor who came to work for the firm was gay. He said, I'm thinking of starting my own practice um, as a gay solicitor. Would you like to join me? I said, really? What, we, we set up a, a firm as a gay firm as listers? He said, yes. We, 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 the, law, the law society just said that solicitors can advertise. Oh. So we can advertise as gay solicitors. <laughs> I said, can we really? He said, well, I think so. Anyway, before we set the firm up, we wrote off to the law society. And we said, now that lawyers can advertise, can we advertise as gay solicitors? And they said, uh, 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 we've never been asked that one before. Uh, we'll have to have a meeting to find out. And they had a meeting and they came back some days later when we badgered them for an answer. They said, well, we've had a meeting and we can't find anything in the rules which says you can't. So, so I said, well, therefore we can. Well, yes, therefore you can. Oh, so in 1985, oh. 1899, we were the first firm to advertise in the gay press as gay solicitors. Oh, oh. And that brought in lots and lots of clients because men were then being sent to prison for cottaging on a regular basis. And they all pleaded guilty 
and, and went to jail, we said, no, don't plead guilty, plead not guilty, go and fight it. And we would always go for trial by jury. And 50% or 52% actually, of the ones we took to trial by jury, the jury acquitted. My God. Yes. But please explain cottaging very quickly for the audience. Cottaging? Oh, that's when two gay men go into a, uh, a public lavatory uh, and... Okay. Oh, I see, because the Americans might know what cottaging is. Uh, the audience in the States probably would Right. Know. I oh, believe that, we that, call that tea room. Tea room, do you? Mm. Oh, I see. Yes. And usually what happened in this country was because the police have to get a number of convictions before they can get promotion. I see. If they're coming up to the deadline when they've got to have a few more convictions, what, they go off to the local gents, stand there, waving their dick out at somebody who comes in, unsuspecting, and just touches it. You're arrested. I'm a police officer. Yeah. 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 And they've set them up. You said 52% of these were eventually yes. uh, acquitted. Yes. We, we, went, we went to trial by jury, and 52% okay. resulted in acquittals. Wow. So that was how I first became a lawyer in 1989. Tell me more about the Spanner case logistics. It, it, it's, it's very involved. It's multi-layered. Oh. Please explain well, that. Well, as I say, I went along to SM Gaze where they gave a mm -hmm. talk about it. Mm -hmm. Then SM Gaze used to do a course of six lectures okay. called Introduction to the Hard Scene, I think. And they said, would you do a lecture on SM and the law? And that'll be the last lecture. I said, OK. So then I had to go and research one and write one, which, which I did. And I researched the history of the Spanish case and how it came about. And it is a, it is a tragic, tragic tale of catastrophe after catastrophe. Yes. And it goes back a long way. <coughs> and in fact, ironically, it goes back to right here where we are in Soho. Because in the 1960s and in the 1970s, the Metropolitan Police obscene publication squad used to come down here and go into the pawn shop selling porn, confiscate all the porn and prosecute the people selling the porn. Oh. And what the police then did was went and sold it again elsewhere. So they were t the, 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 the squad was totally corrupt. Mm. Mm. And Sir Robert Mark, who was then the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, realised that this was going to come out as a scandal. He, the entire squad was totally corrupt. Now, what can I do about it? Well, he thought, I could sack them all and then appoint other officers. Well, they'll just become corrupt as quickly as that because police officers were not very well paid in those days. It supplemented uh, their pension. Uh, so he thought, what am I going to do? I've got a bright idea. I will appoint fundamentalist Christian police officers to run the obscene publication squad. Okay. <laughs> and it worked. It worked My because, gosh. of course, they went in, confiscated all the porn, and destroyed it uh, because uh, of their Christian uh, beliefs and arrested the people selling it. And the, the porn industry down here was closed down. Uh -huh. Now, we had Mrs. Thatcher as Prime Minister with an economy going down the, the hill. Yes. And her remedy for that was unemployment and cuts, 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 cuts to government expenditure. And everything could be cut, she cut. One thing that she wanted to cut out was the obscene publication squad, because they had nothing to do. So that's the, that, that, that was the background of it. The scene now shifts to North Wales, up in the uh, far part of the country, where a man is driving along on his motor car, and he's stopped by the police on a routine check. The police can stop you and say, is this your vehicle, sir? Can I check that the lights work and the brakes work? Can I look through the vehicle, sir? He said, yes, you can look through the vehicle. Now, although they're allowed to check the lights and the brakes and everything else, they're not allowed to look through the vehicle. But he gave them permission. And they found some videos. And I said, what are these? Oh, they're, they're videos. Well, can we take these and have a look at them? And he said, yes, by all means. They should have said no. They had no legal right to take them, but they took them. And they saw videos of gay men having sex. Straight video, um, non-SM videos. And they went back to his house. And they said, have you got any more videos that we can look at? He said, oh, yeah, come in. Naive man. And they looked, and they said, well, can we take all these videos and go look at these? And he said, yes. So they took the videos away. And the videos they saw showed SM scenes. 
and they thought that they had found snuff movies. Mm, they yes. thought people were getting killed. So they immediately launched a murder investigation. And they telephoned the Metropolitan Police because any serious murders or serious crimes, the Metropolitan Police, which is the biggest police force in the country, gets involved. And there was the head of the fire squad, with nothing to do, and he got this call from North Wales, why don't you come and help us investigate stuff movies? Ah, oh, he thought, my job saved. And off he went in his helicopter. And they had a murder investigation, which lasted some time, I don't know how long. And eventually they realised that nobody had been killed at all. <laughs> So right. the murder investigation was dropped and just became a general investigation as to what was going on. But they wanted this man to identify the people in the videos, which he did. And he also, they also took away his address book. So they then contacted everybody in his address book. And they all got visits. And eventually 14 police forces in this country, out of about 40, that's about a third of the police forces in this country, Yes carried on this investigation over years, about seven years I think it was, cost about four million pounds. And at the end of it, they came to the conclusion that the only crimes that had been committed were gross indecency. That is, sucking cocks and things. But they couldn't prosecute anybody for that because there's a time limit for prosecutions of six months. Okay. So there was absolutely <coughs> no crime whatsoever that they could prosecute any of these men for in English law at that time. How do we justify all this expense? How do we justify all these years and years and years? Well, can we not prosecute them for assault, they said. They've all mm -hmm. been assaulting one another. Mm -hmm. Oh no, you can't prosecute them for assault. They consented, that's a defence. If you consent is, 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 is a defence in law to a charge of assault. If you engage in a boxing match, or anything similar to that, you can consent to it. Um, well, let, let's take it to the lawyers and see what they say. And out of the hundreds of men that they had arrested and questioned, they selected 16 or 17 to prosecute. Yes. One, who was Alan Oversby, they prosecuted separately. He was convicted of, um, I think, putting a, 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 a Prince Albert in, into somebody's dick. Um, either with or without an anaesthetic. Um, and the other 16 they prosecuted together on charges of assault. Ah, but they all said, but um, we, they all consented. And the judge argued in the case that yes, you can consent to a assault if there's a good reason. For example, if it's cosmetic surgery, yes. or if it's a piercing and it's done for ornamental <coughs> purposes, or if it's a boxing match, or it's a rugby match. But if there's no good reason, you can't consent. And I find that the satisfaction of sexual libido, to use his expression, is not a good reason. Therefore, I'm going to uh, direct the jury to convict. And each of them had their own barrister. And all their barristers advised them to do was to plead guilty, and then you'll get a much lesser sentence, probably just a fine, or be let off. So they all pleaded guilty. They didn't even put it to the jury. Oh. who may very well have acquitted. Yeah. They all pleaded guilty, but to their horror, instead of getting just a fine of a few hundred pounds, they got sentences of four and a half years and downwards. Yeah. So they appealed to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal reduced those sentences, I think, to three years. The four and a half came down to three, and the others proportionately. But they were all, the convictions were upheld. Yeah. So that's the, that's the background leading up to the, to the actual case, which, as I say, is, is a very s sad and sorry tale. I can't help but wonder why this gentleman you mentioned opened up all these videos for, for people to see. Mm. I, I, I'm a bit dismayed by that. Why did he do this? I don't know. Uh, but, of course, one of the points I used to get across when I was lecturing was to give all, all the little boys there to know their rights so they would never make the same mistake themselves. Because these men would never have been convicted if they hadn't provided the evidence in the video form and if they hadn't admitted it out of their own mouths and signed statements. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible, Incredible and tragic. And tragic, because mm -hmm. of course, they all had their lives ruined. 
Take us the next step with this. Mm. Where did the case go forward? Oh, well, after the Court of Appeal, it went to the House of Lords, which is our equivalent of the Supreme Court. Yes. In fact, about five or six years ago, the House of Lords was renamed the Supreme Court. We now have a Supreme Court as well. And in the Supreme Court, there were five judges who heard it, and two of them um, voted that all the acquittals, sh or that they should all be acquitted, and three of them did not. So by the smallest of ma majorities, they, they lost in the House of Lords. And then the next step, of course, was to go to the European Court of Human Rights, which they did. And I'm afraid the European Court also dismissed their appeal on the basis that the enforcement of morals was a matter which each nation could decide for itself. And it wasn't a matter of the European Court. Incredible. That would probably go differently today if, if I, I think that the uh, attitudes have changed. How do you mean that? Please explain that a little oh, bit. Oh, um, the European Court of Human Rights was set up after the Second World War. Yes. The sort of eight principles. And the judges have kept on expanding those principles as they've gone on. Um, one of the principles was you have a right to a private life. They've now expanded that saying you have a right to be gay. Uh, okay. It's a bit like the American Supreme Court, which <laughs> keeps expanding the law and, uh, and, and reinterpreting it. How do you feel the Spanner case impacted any decisions made in that department? Which department? The, as, as the court has, has expanded the rights and has changed its points Oh, of it, view. It, 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 it is still the law. So if, if the police wanted to prosecute you, they could prosecute you. Okay. And what the Spanish Trust was then t t tasked with doing after the appeal had failed was to try and get the law changed which of course is what we've been trying to do for the years ever since and haven't succeeded, at least not in this country. We might succeed in Japan, but not in this country. But do you feel that a modern judge, if it were to be, if it were to be brought forward today, do you feel that it would be viewed in the same situation as it was um, years ago? Oh no, I don't, I don't think it would at all. And in fact, there have been subsequent cases that have gone to the Court of Appeal They've all been uh, involved, involving uh, heterosexual couples where, where the judges have ruled that consent was a valid defence. Do you feel Spanner is what has brought that about? Um, well, th those cases wouldn't have gone and been prosecuted, those straight ones, if it hadn't been for the Spanner case. And the prosecution clearly were, were trying it on. And the interesting thing was they went to the Court of Appeal and when they lost, they didn't take it on to the Supreme Court because they didn't want to risk upsetting the Spanner case, which you could have done. How do you mean? What does that mean? Oh, well, we, ha yeah. we have two levels of appeal in this country. We yes. have the initial court, yes. and then we have the Court of Appeal, and then we have the Supreme Court. Yes. And the Supreme Court overrules all the, the other others. courts below. Yeah. And the Spanner decision now is, is at a Supreme Court level, you see. So, so when the prosecution got a, an acquittal, on a straight case in the Court of Appeal, they didn't go on to the Supreme Court because they didn't want to risk overturning the Spanner decision, if that makes sense. It does, but why not? Why not? Oh, the, the government don't want to change the Spanner law, they want to keep it. Oh, oh. Because it wins votes for them. It's, it wouldn't be popular to change it. I That's see. why we haven't succeeded I in changing see. it. There's no votes in it. Uh, We've been okay. and talked to the civil servants, we convinced them that it should be changed. And they said, well, you convinced us, but we're not going to convince the ministers. There are no votes in it. I there are more votes in keeping the law as it is than there are in changing it. Do you feel it would ever be changed? That there's any future Well, it's very interesting you should say that because I've been thinking about that only the last few days. Because up until last week, there was absolutely no way it could be changed because Theresa May was one of the most right-wing <laughs> ministers we've ever had. Yes. But Boris Johnson, he was talking on day one about LGBT rights. I think he is amenable to have it changed. So once he's settled down a bit, I think we might well have another go. How will you do that? By waiting until a, a, a bill comes before Parliament which we, into which we could put an amendment. We've done that before. We haven't quite succeeded in getting an amendment through. For example, a criminal justice bill. We, we, we tack something onto that to say that um, consent should be a defence to a charge of assault, even if it involves um, sadomasochistic sex. In other words, it would overrule the Spanner decision. 
Do you really think that that is something that you may see in the next while? It sounds like a very, very big to be, hurdle. To be honest and frank and candid, <laughs> no. Okay, okay. But that doesn't mean you don't try. True, true. Now, the Spanner Trust is what would bring forward whatever... Well, it, it would sort of finance it. It'll okay. have to get some sort of person to um, nominate themselves, to put themselves forward, to bring it in their name. Now, you have lectured about the Spanner case. Mm. How, how, what have you confronted with that? What, what has that, oh, well that done for you? That, that, was, that was to various um, people who were engaging in SM. So that they were aware of what the law was. Okay. So they didn't make videos that could incriminate them if, if, if they uh -huh, got caught. Uh -huh. And so that if the police did come knocking on the door, they knew of their rights and that they could deny access unless they had a warrant. That's the, the main, it, basically education is the reason why I, I used to give the lectures. Now, you, you mentioned the word warrant. I, mm. How did that apply to the people who actually were raided regarding Spanish? Oh, you mean Spanner? Oh, there, there weren't any warrants. And in fact, the police wouldn't have been entitled to get any warrants because they hadn't got any suspicions of any crimes being committed. Then how were they able to invade these people's homes and take these things? They gave them permission. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They were naive and, and, and ignorant. And this I is true of, of all of the litigants, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. They didn't okay. know any better. Okay. They didn't think they'd done anything wrong. And if you don't think anything, you've done anything wrong, why shouldn't you cooperate with the police? Fascinating. Well, fascinating, fascinating and terrifying at the same yes. time. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. I, I, I was reviewing a book here that has some very interesting bits in it, and there's one bit I would like to... Uh, present to you for your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. The author says that the particulars surrounding Spanner and, and the laws regarding BDSM has turned Britain into the most sexually policed country in Europe. What have you to say to that? Um, well, <laughs> someone asked me the other day which is the most um, free and liberal country in Europe, outside of Denmark. <laughs> mm. um, I think probably the UK would be uh, at the bottom of the pile. Um, but I don't think the police at the moment are interested in enforcing the law oh, okay. because they've got other things to do. Yeah. They've got knife crime, they've got terrorism. Um, but the problem is the law is there, it has a chilling effect. Yeah. It's the chilling effect that it has. We're all frightened to engage in SM in case something goes wrong. So although perhaps we're not policed anymore, we're all inhibited. Mm -hmm. We're not free. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go and play in Chicago or Berlin and not in London. Fascinating. Mm. Fascinating. Now, do you feel that the particulars that led up to the police raids regarding the Spanner case 30 some years ago, were they indicative of the time or was there something perhaps that sparked all of that? No, as I think I said to you, it was just indicative of the time. Okay. The vice squad wanting something to do. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to make that, sure I was correctly understanding which that. Is, which, uh, whereas at the time, at the moment, it's completely different. Yeah, the police are not yeah. looking for work to do. They've got far more work than they can possibly cope with. Okay. And that is the reason why they're not remotely interested in the moment in okay. enforcing the sex laws and enforcing the Spanner law. Besides which, I think they know that if it went up to the Court of Appeal now, or the Supreme Court, or the European Court of Human Rights, it would be overturned. Yes, yes. Do you feel truly that Spanner is the catalyst for that, if that were the case, if somebody were to bring something? Because that's what I am slightly confused about. I want mm. to make sure I thoroughly understand that the reason that it wouldn't be viewed in the same vein today is because of what transpired with Spanner. Oh, it, it, there are two reasons. One is that moral attitudes have changed. Oh, we now okay. have gay marriage, okay. um, which has come about recently. Moral attitudes have changed, society has changed, and the law has to change in parallel with that. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. So yes, I think if, if there were another similar prosecution today, a jury would acquit. If the 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 the, 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 the Crown Prosecution Service decided to prosecute in the first place. Do you feel that's the same in the European Court of Appeals, not just here in Britain? Oh, I think they're far more liberal in Europe than we are here. Mm. Okay. Okay. Why do you feel... Well, in Western Europe, anyway. East, Eastern Europe, of course, it's another animal. Is, is, is wholly different. In fact, in fact I think it's, it's probably worse over there. In fact, I think they've got great problems in Poland, haven't they? They do. Yes, they do. So I'm talking about Western Europe. <laughs> but do you, it, it, at the time of Spanner, wasn't it a 15 to 0 uh, decision when they took it to the human, uh, is the, the court of, the human court of Appeals? Is that correct? It's the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court mm. of Human Rights. Mm. Do you feel it would be the same today? No, I think it, could, it would well go the other way. Mm. Okay, okay. So today's Spanner Trust is, w what exactly is it doing and what does well, it achieve today? Be, 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 be because we, we've got a government that won't change the law because it's the no votes in it, there's not a lot for it to do at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which, in a way, is a good thing. Uh, it, there's not a lot for it to do because nobody's been prosecuted for SM sex. Okay. Okay. So that's a good thing. Yes. That's a good thing. But yet you're still reluctant to engage in that here, even though there's been no prosecution recently. Ah, well, just because there's been no prosecution doesn't mean there can't be one. Yeah. And if, you know, if somebody goes and complains that I've just been assaulted, and that's what usually happens. Someone's not allowed into a party. They go and complain to the police. Uh-huh, mm. I see, I see, I mm. see. What do you think will be the ultimate legacy of Spanner? Probably the most important criminal case of, 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 of the last uh, half, a, half a century. That's a very strong statement. It's a very strong statement. Yeah, no, if, if, if you go to the university law departments, that's what they will say. And all the law students all say that it was wrongly decided by the judges uniformly. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. So the lawyers that are coming up will not approve of it. So someone facing something today, what advice would you have for them? Oh, don't say anything until you're spoken to a lawyer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fascinating. Okay, John, you've, you've changed your outfit in order to conclude your interview, and I find your letters absolutely stunning. They... They carry so much personality, so much history. I would like very much if you would tell us about the amazing leather that you're wearing and show us a little bit. Okay, well, one of the reasons why uh, I became a Spanish trustee was because not only was a lawyer, and you've seen me in my lawyer's garb, but I'm also, I prefer to be in my leathers than in my lawyer garb. Wouldn't we all? Yeah, and, and this is a pair of shorts which my ex-boyfriend gave to me, he was sadly no longer with us. So these are very, very memorable and special. And of course I was love wearing my harness. Tell us more about the shorts, why are they so special? Oh, well he bought them in 1952 in Austria. So they have a provenance. Yeah. And also, of course, I'm wearing my, uh, my, my jacket, which I had from uh, McQueen in Chicago which is the second proudest day of my life. My proudest day of my life was when I got my law degree from the Queen Mother. Okay. I was a real queen. The second proudest day of my life was when I got my Chicago Hellfire Club. Shall I show them to you? Yes, please, please. From a, a queen in Chicago. Any queen in particular? I can't remember his name now. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. That's all I right. appreciate it. Okay. Uh, again, I, I thank you so very, very much for teaching me a little bit more about the minutia and complexities of the Spanner case and for contributing to the overall education of Spanner and why we are here in London to do this. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.